And good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and this is what I call my morning musings. On Fridays, I normally have a very special segment in which I respond to the critics, uh, in which I do book reviews, in which I examine claims <clears throat> by those who whose claims stand in opposition to covenant eschatology. Now, don't forget, I announced just recently, I will be doing a review of a brand new book. It's, it's just now out. Let's see if I can get that over there. <laughs> uh, by, by my friend, Steve Gregg. Now, I had a two-day formal debate with Steve Gregg in Denver, Colorado in 2013. Very cordial, very friendly debate. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I don't think Steve was quite prepared uh, to try to answer the things that were presented by me. Uh, I know for a fact that there are several people who are now full preterist as a result of that debate, uh, people who had been followers of Steve, Gre Steve Gregg for a good long while. But nonetheless, <clears throat> he has written this book, Why Not Full Preterism? Now, this book amounts to a critique of Don K. Preston because uh, in, in this book of, uh, let me see here, 370 pages, uh, he mentions my name no less than 140 times. I'm not offended by that, by the way. Uh, he's cordial. Uh, he's respectful. So I have no problem whatsoever with uh, being reviewed. Uh, I do have a problem with being misrepresented, which my friend does do uh, occasionally in the book. So... Uh, perhaps I could be corrected at another time. In my review, which will be upcoming in the near future, I will correct that misunderstanding on the part of, uh, of Steve Gregg. So be looking for that uh, when I am through with my review and response and refutation of N.T. Wright. Uh, I'll be taking two weeks off uh, to do some other things, uh, really pressing. I'm <laughs> <clears throat> I am trying really, really hard to finish up a book that I've been working on for over three years, okay? Uh, the working title has been The Last Day, Last Hour, Last Trumpet Resurrection, Study of Sukkot and the Resurrection. Well, that's too long. Uh, the working title at this moment, <clears throat> Sukkot and the Last Trumpet Resurrection. Now, don't forget, I mentioned to you if you have a suggestion for a good, short, pithy, uh, catchy title for this book, I've already given you an idea of what it's all about, and that is <clears throat> the fulfillment of Israel's feast days. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, in this book, uh, Steve Gregg says Israel's feast days have nothing to do with genuine biblical eschatology. He says, I'm completely wrong to make that claim. Well, we'll see. We shall see. But he's wrong. Anyway, <clears throat> so you know what my upcoming book is going to be. And no, I do not know exactly when it's going to be published. Like I said, I've been working on it for over three years. So, you know, uh, it takes time. <clears throat> but if you have a, a relatively short, pith, pithy, catchy title that captures the essence of the Feast of Sukkot, the fulfill fulfillment of Sukkot being the resurrection of the dead, then send it to me. Now, I've already had a few suggestions. None of them have rang my bell yet. But if I choose your title, when the book is published, I will send you a copy of the book free. Now, it's already 400 pages long, folks. So this is not a minor book. This is not a small book. There's a lot of material in it. <clears throat> so, go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, eschatology.org. If you've got a title suggestion, send it to me. I'm keeping a file. I have a record of all of the suggestions that have been made to me so far. So, send me your suggestion. Get in the running for a free copy of this book when it's finally published. All right. Now, back to N.T. Wright, and why N.T. Wright is wrong 
on the redemption of creation. Now let's not forget, N.T. Wright believes that at some point of time in the future, <clears throat> the literal, physical, material creation <clears throat> will undergo a radical, radical renovation, a radical recreation, a radical redemption. To put it in phraseology that I like to use, he believes that one of these days, bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes will be delivered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Now, I categorically reject that view. I do not believe that the redemption that Christ purchased is for bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. I don't believe it's for dogs and cats. As much as I like my dogs and my cats, I've got two of each. Redemption is for that which is fallen, which was lost, and that refers to mankind. So, I believe on that point alone, N.T. Wright is wrong. Now, last week I introduced to you the concept, and by the way, thank you so much for all the great comments on that video. <clears throat> the Old Testament foretold the coming new heaven and the new earth. They foretold the time in which God would make a, a, a covenant with the birds of the air and the animals of the field, as it is expressed. But in reality, it was a covenant, the new covenant that God would make with Israel. Hosea 2, 18 to 23, or 18 to 21. <clears throat> I've shared with you the fact that each of the Old Testament prophecies that foretold the coming of the new creation are invariably posited at the time of the destruction of the old covenant world of Israel and the creation of the new covenant world of Jesus Christ. The new creation of Jesus Christ. You know, the one that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is new creation. For Paul, the new creation had already been initiated, had already been established. It was not fully realized, which raises the question, does it not? If not, why not? If the new creation, if the redemption of creation if the recreation of creation it involved making bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes better bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes, and trees better, grass greener, rivers purer, if that's what it meant, then after 2,000 years, why are we not seeing mosquitoes that don't bite us, for crying out loud? Why don't we see poison ivy that doesn't, you know, give us this? Or is poison ivy the best it can be by giving us the itches? Huh. But I think it's a valid question. If the new creation had already been established, and it had, N.T. Wright agrees with that, then why is it not true that material, physical creation <clears throat> has not gotten better? since the first century. But to move on, I pointed out last week that the Old Testament made those prophecies of the coming new creation, and they put that those prophecies, it shall come to pass in those days. It shall come to pass in the last days. And I pointed out how N.T. Wright does a marvelous job of showing, especially in the book of Romans, how what was once said to be far off once said to be in those days, once said to be for the last days, Paul is very clear they were speaking of his day, his time, and it's, <clears throat> it is what Paul calls the now time. So what the Old Testament prophets longed for but did not see, Paul says he was living in the now time of fulfillment, which once again raises that question, doesn't it? 
If Paul said he was living in the now time of what the Old Testament prophet said was going to happen, and the Old Testament prophet spoke of a covenant with birds and birds and beasts, then why don't we see birds and beasts, you know, living long, 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 long time? Or being better physically. But the point I made last week, and let me drive it home. Kind of funny on YouTube, I've had a lot of people comment trying to diffuse the power of what I <clears throat> what I had to say. Oh, you're just creating a term when you're talking about <clears throat> redemption of creation. You're just making up a term. No, I'm not. Scholars have been using that term for literally centuries. It's not my term. This is someone trying to deflect from the power of what Paul said when he said he was living in the now time of what the Old Testament prophets said. Now let's drive that home even more. And I don't want to protract this discussion, so I'm going to keep my comments on what I'm about to present to you uh, pretty brief, okay? I'm going to keep them pretty brief. But notice Romans chapter 8, after saying, I consider that the suffering of this present time, literally the now time, worthy to be compared with the glory that is literally about to be revealed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Greek word translated as to be, or as the New Revised Standard Translation renders it, the about to be revealed. <clears throat> is the Greek word mellow. And I have to tell you, I, I get downright amused when I read attempts by futurists to rebut covenant eschatology. And they say, people like to say, <clears throat> the entire case of preterism hangs on the word mellow. Well, let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, that is false. Pure and simple, it's a fabrication. The entire case, I can tell you this, I have never attempted to build my case for covenant eschatology on the word mellow. Have I incorporated mellow? Well, sure, why not? It is powerful, <clears throat> but I have never said, I have never implied, I've never inferred nor have I ever agreed with the idea or the claim that the entire structure of preterism hangs on the Greek word mellow. I want to tell you, that's a straw man argument. And men such as Steve Gregg, on starting page 63 of his book, he tries to counter the time statements. And he has a discussion of mellow. I won't go into it right now. I'll go into it later. But basically, his approach and the approach of most people, when they come to the word mellow, and by the way, it's in the what's known as the infinitive, used most commonly in, in the infinitive in the New Testament. And let me just to simply take note that the Blast de Bruner, Greek-English grammar, of the New Testament, under item number 356, I believe it is, forgot the page number, I can give it to you if you want it, just contact me, Blaster Bruner says, Meline, that's mellow, Meline is in the infinitive form, Meline in the infinitive indicates eminence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is a highly, highly influential Greek grammar. Meline in the infinity, infinitive indicates eminence. A book was written some years ago entitled Luke and the Last Things by A.J. Mathilde. It was one of the most definitive studies of the Greek word mellow that had been done up to that point of time. I have a copy of it in my library. I actually corresponded with A.J. Mathilde uh, quite extensi extensively before his passing some years ago. Very cordial guy. I had a great time corresponding with him. And by the way, I have to note this. When I presented my argument on 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the argument that I present in my book, In Flaming Fire, he said it was the most convincing argument 
for the futurist to him position, for the preterist position, that he had ever encountered in his life, he did not have an answer for it. Just passing it along. So, <clears throat> the word mellow is used some 100, I believe it's 110 times in the New Testament. Here's what you need to know about the Greek word mellow. Every single lexicon, with but one exception that I'm aware of, and that's Bowles and Schneider. Bowles and Schneider tries to argue away the entire argument of A.J. Mathilde. Their article under Mello is trying to ignore or trying to argue away the force of the argument of A.J. Mathilde. They fail. They fail miserably. Every other Greek lexicon with which I am familiar, maybe I've missed something, okay? It's always possible. <clears throat> Every lexicon that I'm aware of, with the exception of Balls and Schneider, says the primary meaning, do you catch the power of this? The primary, basic, first definition of mellow is about to be, to be on the point of doing. And then they go into explanations and say, well, it can be a paraphrastic for the simple future. And my take on that claim is they're looking for a way out of the admission that mellow means on the point of. But here's what happens. The opponents of covenant eschatology, they come to the Greek word mellow, and look, it is used throughout the New Testament. Like I said, if I'm not mistaken in my count, something like, like 110 times, over and over and over again. The context absolutely demands that what was being said was about to take place. And you know what? The Gospel of John the translators, over and over, render it as about to be. And then they come to passages that are eschatological about the resurrection. Now look, there are some major translations that, rem that render passages such as Acts 24, 14 and 15, where Paul said, this I confess to you, verse 13, that after the way which they call a sect, that's the Pharisees, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets, that there is about to be the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Now, in a new translation of the Diaglot, not the, uh, not the Jehovah's Witness version, New Revised Standard, host of other translations render it as about to be. The the King James Version 3 renders it as about to be, if I'm not mistaken, as they do also Acts 17, 30, and 31. But again, here's what happens. The opponents of covenant eschatology, they see that the primary definition of mellow is about to be. And they say, oh, goodness gracious, if, if we allow that translation to stand, then that means that the resurrection was, going to, was about to occur in the first century. We can't have that because we don't believe the resurrection has taken place yet. So what do they do? Well, very, very, very often, they run over to the Septuagint. And they find an exceptional situation. They find a passage where Mellow is not best translated, maybe, as about to be. And they go, ah, oh, see, this text doesn't mean about to be. Therefore, it can't mean about to be in Acts chapter 24. Preterist movement, preterist argument, totally blown up, totally falsified, dead. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what is known as an illegitimate totality transfer. It is a logical fallacy 
And look, if you have a word that normally means, let's say, oh, you know, 110 times. Let's say you can find one or two or three examples in which that word is used in a way that is different from the way it's used in the other 105 or 6 or 7 occurrences. Do those exceptional uses, usages falsify the primary definition? Let me give you an illustration, okay? Let me give you an illustration. I live in cattle country, Ardmore, Oklahoma, southern U.S., Lots and lots and lots of cattle around here. Now, if I were to ask you, what color is an Angus cow? Well, I suspect that most of you know enough about cattle. You say, well, Angus are black. Oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. What if I go to a cattle farm one day and I see, I see two or three white cows. They have the structure of an Angus, they have the face of an Angus, they have the build of an Angus, but they're white, or they're painted, you know, black and white. And I jump up and say, no, okay. oh, well, uh, look, I got to tell you, I always thought Angus were black, but there's three cows, Angus cows, that are white or black and white, therefore, Angus cows are not black. And you would go, Preston, you're being silly. And I would go, yes, I am. Because you know the fallacy of that kind of an argument. You know it is inappropriate, it is wrong, it is eisegetic, to, to make that kind of an argument. It is illogical, it is irrational, and it is wrong. But you know what? Almost every single opponent of covenant eschatology that I have encountered, they want to run to an Old Testament usage of Melo and the Septuagint that may, may, not be best translated as about to be. And so they proclaim, ah, preterism is false. Or they go to a couple of passages in the New Testament in which a person could conceivably, possibly, maybe say that Mello did not mean in that passage about to be, to be on the point of. So they run to one or two or three passages, and they say, ah, oh, see, Mello cannot mean about to be. Let me say again, ladies and gentlemen, you know, down deep, you know, using that kind of an argument is absolutely specious. It is untenable. It is wrong. So what does that mean? The primary definition of mellow, and especially in the infinitive, is that it indicates eminence. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this now time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed. It doesn't matter what your concept or my concept of the nature of the redemption of creation might be. Paul said it was about to be revealed. And as we continue examining Romans 8, 18 and following, I'm going to drive that point home even more. In the meantime, go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, Order a copy of my book, Like Father, Like Son, on Clouds of Glory. I have a discussion of Romans chapter 8, including Mello, in that book. I think you'll find it extremely helpful. So order the book, send me a note that says you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping.
All right. Hey, thanks so much for joining me on this morning's uh, morning musings, responding to the critics. You have a very safe weekend. Please stay cool, and I'll see you on Monday.